cause hurt, or whatever it is, that you choose to love us. You choose mercy, and you choose grace. Wow. Meet me at the tip of my tongue as I bring your word this evening, Father, that whatever is not of you would be dismissed from the minds of your people. Father, everything that, that comes from you would just be printed deep within our hearts. That when all is said and done, we would be, be, we would be able to stand. So we trust you, we love you, and we thank you. Thank you for this evening. Thank you for your word. Lord God, we thank you for Jesus. And it's in his name, the name of all names, the name of your son, our Lord, our Savior, Jesus the Christ, the risen King, that I pray and ask these things with expectation because I can. I'm your son. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Amen. So when somebody asks you guys where you guys live, where do you live? What's the thought that comes into your head? Picture your face, your freshly vacuumed carpet, your clean kitchen. But now if Jesus is asking, where do you live? Where do you reside? Am I going to tell him on Kauai Street? Or am I going to reiterate his words back to him? The Bible says, in verse 20 of Philippians chapter 3, our citizenship is in heaven. And throughout scripture, God reminds us over and over that this is not our permanent location. And he doesn't want us to treat it that way either. First scripture, well, that was the next scripture is in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 13. And Paul says that he has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us. So he transferred us into the kingdom of the Son of His love. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 6 and Jesus raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. We gotta think about that. Because when somebody says, I gotta go home, I gotta just stop by home and grab something. And that's okay. As long as we realize that this is temporary. But too many times we get off track, Christians. We get off track and and we don't grasp exactly who we are. So where do you live? Earth? in heaven. How about this one? Where do you live? <coughs> in yesterday? In time? Or in eternity? So if you've come to Jesus for salvation, 
You're a citizen of heaven. That's it. You're a citizen of heaven. On temporary assignment on earth. Okay, I really like you guys get that. I really want you guys to, to get that because if you miss that, you guys miss something huge. That's everything. That's where our power comes from. That's where our sustenance comes from. Not here. Paul says over and over again that this is temporal. All this will pass. Jesus said all this will pass. But his word will remain. Why? His word is eternal. So eternity goes this way and on and on and on and it goes that way and on and on and on. It never stops. So let's go back to Philippians chapter 3, verse 12. Now this is Paul reading it. He says, Not that I have already attained or am already perfected. Now this is Paul who said that Paul is the most biblically educated, spirit-filled, spirit-led Who wrote most of the New Testament? So if Paul says that I have not yet arrived, oh, where does that leave me? And where does that leave us? But he continues on and he says, okay, so not that I have already attained or I have already perfected. But I press on. In 13, he says, Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but the one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward. Verse 14 says, I press toward. So right here, just this short passage. He says, I press on. I forget the things that are behind. And I press forward. And that's really important for us. Because all of us, have a yesterday. And in that yesterday, there's three things. There's good things. There's stuff, that, there's accomplishments that we've had. There's achievements. Things that we're proud of. And that's good. There's some good stuff. But then if you guys are like me, some bad stuff in the past. Yesterday I had some bad stuff. Yesterday I had hurts. There was brokenness. So we have that in our yesterday. So we got good stuff. We got the bad stuff. And hope. We get some ugly stuff. Stuff that I wouldn't want anybody to know. Stuff that we're ashamed of. So Paul makes a big point. He says, forgetting. 
those things. I press on. In the gospel, Jesus said, no one, no man who puts his hand to the plow, having looked back, is fit for the kingdom of God. Why? Jesus used a lot of agricultural terms and, and stories because that's what the people knew of the time. Everything was agriculture. When a man put his hand to the plow, he had to make straight lines. Once he starts turning, his lines start going all over. So Paul says, I press on. He wasn't just cruising in his Christian life. Just kind of hoping things would fall into place. Like many Christians do, kind of hope things will be okay. And Jesus is saying, we got to press again. we got to press. Okay. So salvation is free. We get that. We understand that. Paid for by the finished work of, of Jesus you know, at the cross. So salvation is free. Spiritual growth is not. There's a price that comes with spiritual growth. How much are you willing to pay for that deep relationship with Christ? For the empowerment that heaven just wants to yield to you to be able to walk through life victoriously with your head up high, knowing that the king of the universe got your back? That's an eternal perspective. Not hoping that, oh, I hope COVID will go away. I hope we can take off our masks one day. No, we got to press. Okay, what, does, what does pressing mean? When you hear Paul talk about, I press on, I press toward. To press means this. Prioritizing your spiritual growth and experiencing God's divine purpose for your life. Paul says, I press on. I prioritize the spiritual. Why? Remember just a few verses ago, Paul said, he's a citizen of heaven. That's the, that's the kingdom mindset. So how do we do that? Again, Paul says, but the one thing I do, forgetting those things. If Paul didn't forget, because Paul had some ugly stuff. I mean, he had these great accomplishments. He was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He climbed the Pharisaical ladder. He was at the pinnacle. Everybody knew who he was. Teachers came to him. But Paul had some stuff in his past. Paul had some stuff in his yesterday. He was a murderer. He defamed the name of Jesus. So if Paul didn't put that behind him, and pressed on, he would have never been the apostle that Christ planned for him. How about us? How about you? What is it that you keep on, that you keep remembering about yesterday? What is it about yesterday that's still nagging 
at you that's still tripping us up? You ever feel like that? We want to do right, we, we want to do good, but we keep tripping up. So he says, but one thing I do, forgetting that which is behind, I press forward, I press on. Many Christians are crippled by yesterday. So the devil, he's going to do everything he can to stop you, to trip you up. He'll use your yesterday. And he'll do everything he can to keep you chained to yesterday. Because if he keeps you chained to yesterday, you'll never fulfill your God-given destiny. Your divine purpose that he has for, for each one of you guys, for each one of us. I want to bust free. I want to run yeah. with the with everything that God has for Scotty. I want to run with that because I feel it. I feel it bubbling. I'm not quite sure what it is, but I feel it bubbling. And I know you guys do too. So we gotta, it's so important that we forget those things that are behind us and we press. Because if, if the devil can get us to believe it enough, to act on it enough, and move on it enough, he'll get us, he'll get you to define yourself by your yesterday. You know how many years I defined myself by yesterday? And I was overwhelmed with guilt and shame. I didn't even want to talk with people because I didn't want to have to explain to people when they ask me, wow, where you been, bro? You been on fire then? I've never seen you in a long time. Now I'm okay. I was in prison. But I met Jesus. And I've been set free. And I'm moving on. And I'm pressing on. And I'm forgetting the things that are behind. And I'm, I'm pushing forward. That is your divine purpose. So we're not citizens of time, citizens of eternity. And if we can see how teeny bit of time that we have here on earth, 75, 80, 90 years, in light of how huge eternity is, if we can grasp onto that, it changes us. It changes the way we prioritize. It just changes the way we think. And God wants us to have the proper view of eternity so that we maximize time. Your view of eternity affects your view of time. And your view of time, that affects eternity. So again, we're not citizens of earth. And he wants us to see ourselves that we're not citizens of earth. We're visitors. So we press on in light of eternity. We press by making that priority over time. So we can learn from yesterday. There's, there's stuff that we can glean off of and we can, we can learn from yesterday. But he doesn't want us to stay stuck in yesterday.
We can't live in yesterday if we're going to move forward to tomorrow. In the Exodus, Israel didn't get to the promised land because they were stuck in yesterday. What a lesson. So if we're stuck in yesterday, we'll never get to the promised land. What is the promised land? It's your divine purpose. So our purpose has to be secured. It has to be fixed by moving forward in spiritual pursuit of maturity and divine purpose. If we can see that eternity is more important than time, we'll start to maximize our time and be ready for eternity. Philippians 3, 17. Brethren, join in following my example and note those who walk as you have us for a pattern. For many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. Whose end is destruction? Whose God is their belly? And whose glory is in their shame? Who set their minds on earthly things? Guys, we gotta watch out who we hang out with. Sir. Every parent should be concerned about who your kids hang out with. When Christians get messed up because of who they hang out with. I mean, how can you how can you save your marriage if you're talking to your friend who's trying to get a divorce? I'm not talking about worldly people, I'm talking about Christians. And I know you guys have a Christian friend. Right now, you're thinking about him. You're thinking about that one Christian friend who is not abiding by what God's Word says. I get Christian friends like that. And so that's why I choose to hang out with my family. experience this maybe you felt like this or maybe you were the, anyway have you ever seen or heard or been involved with a Christian person and, and you're giving them a heavenly perspective and they get offended they get offended they were Christian and you're coming with heaven's point of view. Well, don't tell me that. That's not what I want to hear right now. Yeah, well, maybe that's what you need to hear. So they don't see the spiritual side. They don't see God's perspective. And all they can give is more earth, more temporal, Nothing of eternal value. It's earthbound Christians. 
So you can be a, a Christian and an enemy of the cross of Christ. Because you downplayed, you diminished your citizenship, your position in heaven for the temporal down here. If you make time more important than eternity, you will lose out on both. But if you make eternity more important than time, this little bit of time, eternity explodes. Okay, one more time. If you make eternity more important than this little bit of time that we have, eternity explodes and time is improved. You know, more recently, I find myself in a rush. And I'm rushing and I'm, I'm getting to where I'm getting and I'm, and I'm looking at the time. And like, gosh, I have seven minutes to get across town. I get all the way across town and I got five minutes left. Wait, I started with seven minutes across town. I get across, I get, I come to this side of town and I got five minutes left. You guys ever experienced that? That is God's grace. Yeah. Now, you're living for the purpose that you are redeemed for. So Paul says, our citizenship is in heaven, not here. We were redeemed here, but not for here. We were redeemed for heaven while here. And God expects his kids, you and me, To live like that. He expects his kids to bring heaven's point of view into earth's decisions and earth's priorities. Isn't it cool when we have our priorities? And then all of a sudden, we can be going through the Word, or just fellowshipping, or just worshipping. And God will just revamp your priorities. And He takes the burden out of them. That's what He does. In verse 20, Philippians 3, Paul says, For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul is excited. If you read his letters, you can, you can see, you can, you can feel his excitement. Yeah, he's in chains. Yeah, he's beaten. Hungry, cold. But he's excited. Why? Because Paul grasped the fact that he is a citizen of heaven. It changed him. There's something called the imminent return of Christ. Imminent means it's going to happen. He's coming back. We don't know when. But he's coming back. And he wants us ready. Okay, so this is the question. 
if Jesus came back right now, if he showed up in this room right now, would you be excited? Yeah. Or would you say, gosh, I need one more day to get right. I need one more day to do something good. I need one more day because I didn't press all this time. But you're here, Jesus, and I like press. I like push on. The kingdom mindset. So tomorrow's not promised to us. All we have is right now. We've had a lot of right nows. We've had a lot of nows. There's this young man, this boy, on this football team. He doesn't play, doesn't get out on the field, because he fools around, he likes to goof off, and just doesn't take it seriously. He's just there. He's a running back, like on the third or fourth string, never gets on the field because just not serious. So on this one day, this game, First string is playing, the running back gets hurt. Second string comes in, gets hurt. The next one goes in, gets hurt. Only get this boy left. So the coach says, hey, you're in. So the boy gets out on the field. gets the ball and runs like a, a maniac, madman, banging through people, jumping over people, running like a wild man. Play after play, boys scoring touchdowns, first downs. He's... Boy, put on a clinic. Put on a show. So after the game was done, the coach said, Bro, all this time, you fool around in practice, nothing, you know, so you don't get out on the field. But today, Boy looks at the coach. Tears coming down his face. Tells the coach, you know my dad was blind. Yeah. Two days ago, my father died. It's the first time he saw me play. We got a father who's watching. And he's cheering. And he's waiting and he's and he's he's got expectation and he's because he only has good thoughts toward us. Only. I like to think of myself as a good father, as a good dad. But I don't only have good thoughts towards my kids. I love them. But I have a dad, you have a dad, who only has good thoughts toward you.
Okay, so it's the fourth quarter game. And the coach just called your name. Come on, get out on the field. And run like he never ran before. Give everything you got. Because your daddy watching. So we forget those things which are behind. And we press on. Love you guys. Thank you. 